All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. First off, hope everybody had a good Easter last Sunday. I know we took a, a Sunday off, so I hope you were able to spend time with family and have a, a great day under the circumstances. Real quick, I'll just go over like I do every week, just rules of engagement. Let's just make sure you're always muted so we don't have any background noise. And if you do want to talk, just unmute yourself. And when you're done, put yourself back on mute. Or you can write in the chat if you've got questions for uh, Anthony or Rodney, you're more than welcome to, to do that. Again, let's just be respectful of each other, be highly professional. Um, I'm really excited about today's topic. We're going to be going over flopping or embellishment. Um, it's something that we definitely see a lot more at the high school level that we're seeing that's trickling down from MBA and college. So I'm really excited to get some feedback and some knowledge to help us get these plays, how to see these plays and how to adjudicate them uh, correctly. So I'm excited to have Rodney Mott, the obviously founder of DDR Run, veteran NBA referee, to, to guide us through and, and educate us, along with Anthony uh, Jordan, who's a Division I referee. Um, it's going to be fantastic knowledge. Trey Maddox is on another call in Vegas. I just talked to him as soon as he's done, and he's going to jump in and, and help us as well. And like I said, the way that I do it is I'll run two clips, game speed, and hopefully it's not too blurry for you guys or it doesn't glitch. And then I'll go slow-mo, and then we'll just navigate through it. But, again, dialogue is, is, is wanted, is needed. Ask as, 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 you know, as many questions as you need to. We'll try to get, you know, as much as we've done. I've got four clips to go over and then two on the tail end if we get to them. But I, do want, I don't want to be here all night. I want to be highly productive in, you know, 60 to 90 minutes, whatever it is, or how much time Rodney and, and uh, Anthony have for us. But, again, I uh, appreciate you guys being on, taking the time to get better. With that being said, I'll go ahead and, and get the first clip up. Rodney and Anthony, if you guys are ready, and then we'll just Absolutely. press forward that way. All right. Again, appreciate you guys being on. Okay, again, I'll go twice, game speed, and then we'll go get through it this way. One more time. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it's a little clearer on, on y'all. No, things. Mark, it is. Actually, they are clearer, much clearer. Okay, good. Okay. Um, All right. Go ahead, and then just let me know when you want to start, stop, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through. Absolutely. So, clearly, you got an embellishment right here on the defender. Um, difficult, difficult play. Here's why. So, you got Go to the part mark of contact and watch what happens to the offensive guy. Watch what the offensive guy does. Stop right there. So in the college game, in the college game, you can have, and this is good to know, in the college game, you can have a flopping situation with contact. And you might say, well, man, what what if? You know, it might strike your head and, you know, kind of rub your temple a little bit. But, yes, and that would be an example of that. Although the offensive guy does, you know, dip his shoulder a little bit, the contact that he does is not warranted of a guy sliding almost eight feet um, of him throwing himself off of that contact. So he's trying to make that little, that little movement right there, that, that little dip of the shoulder, not even an extension of the arm. He's trying to make that make you call that play. In the college game, that would be warranted of a flopping signal. That would be a warning. Um, and, the, and, and the basis of that is to get that type of play out of it. Either you want him to go through him or you want him to, to, to take the, um, you know, either go with the offensive foul and or just get there first where if you have, so you can call the play as it stands. A tough play to begin with. I don't need help by, by, the, def by the defensive guy throwing himself now another eight feet off of a play that really did not require that type of effort. So I'm looking at the position of the side official. Good. He can actually, he can see both the defender as well as the offensive player. He has a good line of view between them. And um, he definitely sees the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the defender now throws himself. And another thing that you want to look for, you want to look for the extra antics, the hands going up in the air, the neck going back. Um, Mark, I, I like to tell people before it got into the college and the pro level, as a as a FIBA official, this right here is every day for us for the last ten years of my life. And until FIBA decided to turn it turn this around, 
um, shortly before the NCAA and the NBA started to do it, this was our game every single night, right? The penalties are different, whatnot, but those are the things that you look for when you're trying to establish, you know, you know, the rules of the games, if you will. Rodney? Yeah, what I, what I first notice here is the discipline of the lead and the slot or center referee. Yes. The lead is looking at the back of the defender, so has no clue on the amount of contact or no contact on the play. The, the center has to play all the way, and you can tell just from he didn't flinch or anything, you can tell that his eyes is on the defender. Yep. By refereeing the defender, you can tell that there's an illegal contact or if it's a flop, because like Anthony said, the arms go back, he slides you know, eight feet off the floor. So I love the discipline of the referees because their eyes are in the right place. The, the, lead, the lead is not coming over trying to take the play because he does not have an open look at the play. And the slot is on the play all the way. And does not, he doesn't flinch, doesn't have a whistle. And now he goes to the secondary defender on the shot. Mm -hmm. And you can tell he did not flinch whatsoever. So that is, that, that's what caught my eye right away. Because Absolutely. If you're the defender, if you are refereeing that defender, you can tell if it's a legal contact or if that defender flops immediately. Because now, if I'm watching that defender, I can see if the offensive player created enough contact to cause the offensive foul. Exactly. And, and the, 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 the word he used right here is discipline. Because as you can see, this play ain't waiting for nobody. The next play happens as soon as the first play is over with. So now you got now you go from a tough you now you go from a tough play that you're gonna that you're trying to determine whether it's a flop or a charge or a block, and now you go into a contested jump shot. Well, now you got a referee whether he you know whether we uh, uh, verticality play with from a, from a defender going into his shot and now allowing him to land, which is yet again another good credit to the slot official on this particular play being able to referee that um that the very next play. Good point. Any any questions? Any for uh, Anthony or or Rodney on, on this? Hey, Rodney. So, um, hey, Mark, go ahead and let yes. it play through real quick. I'm I'm gonna sure. state state this as well too. Let it play through. So, if we deem this play right, if we deem this play a flop, let me see if he makes it or not. I'm trying to see if the ball goes yeah, he, in. Yeah, he does. He does. All right, boom. Stop right there. See, at that point in time, that slot official would have the responsibility of doo -doo -doo, blowing his whistle. And, 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 and this is specifically for the college game. I'll, I'll be sure to make those differentiates, differentiates when we talk about that. Um, but they, we, we will be responsible now to stop the game and or give the first warning at that particular time, just for, just for uh, mechanic sakes. But go ahead. Reggie, go ahead, Reggie. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, Rodney and A or AJ, can you guys, uh, this is Reggie, uh, can you guys speak on the positioning and the uh, discipline of the lead by him uh, pinching the paint and not trying to rotate during the drive? My, go ahead, um, you was talking about that. Yeah, um, if, we, if we run it back a little bit. Uh, stop right there. Okay. So right now, he is in a perfect position. He, he closes down, or what you guys call pinch in the paint, he closes down, anticipating his drive. But right now, he is really refereeing the, the two guys that's in the key. Because he, he has not picked up this play yet. He shouldn't have picked up this play yet. Continue. Let it run. So now, the, the lead is still should be off this play. But at this point right now, he's, he's anticipating a possible baseline drive. So that's why his eyes go there. But he does not put air in the whistle, but he's in a perfect position right now because one, he is, he is looking at the back of this referee, uh, back of this defender, but he is in position for rebounding coverage. Yeah. So that is going to be his main responsibility. If the, if the offensive player gets around on the baseline, now he's responsible for the step out of bounds, 
and or the secondary defender coming over. Because once if that if that offensive player beats that defender, the the secondary defender will come over and defend. So right now he's in a perfect position. Yeah. And just add though, and just add while you while you're pausing it for a second, um, Reggie. You notice, like Rodney said, as soon as he recognizes, although he's refereeing the post, but as soon as he recognizes an imminent play of the basket, that stops his rotation. That right there was his cue to saying, "Look, this is not this is not it. You know, this not, I'm not going to force the rotation here into a drive." So, just so you know, it's on that. Uh, Do Donovan Peters here. So at the high school level, something that's not really talked about a lot is actually under the rules of high school, there is a flop, uh, there's a technical foul for flopping, which I don't think I've ever seen too many officials utilize. And you talked about at the NCAA level, at the men, they give a warning. So would you maybe consider giving a technical foul here um, or talking to a coach saying, hey, if he does yeah. that again, I'm going to hit him yeah. with a technical? Because I don't feel so that we utilize that enough in high school. And Donovan, that's a good point. So, and and um, so the answer is yes to everything you just said, right? So, in college, the second one is a mandatory technical foul. Okay, but let's go back to what you just said earlier. Let's say we got. Let's say this is the first play of the game, or we are early in the first quarter, um, or in the first half, and that play happens, right? And um, and that play right there, you know, it's a drive to the basket. It's in the post. It's not in the perimeter. It's not an obvious play to a lot of people, right? So yes, you can go to that player and say, "My man, look, this is consider this your this consider this your courtesy." Or you can go to the coach and say, "Hey, if that's how he's gonna play all night, he ain't gonna be with us, coach." You know, something along those lines to let him know that that right there has is either borderline or it is enough for you if you decide not to call the flopping one. All right. Uh, once again. In college, it has to be a warning first prior to the technical foul. Whereas, and in that warning, there is a little bit of, you know, you can, you can kind of, there's a little bit of uh, flex in there, a little ambiguity in there. If you know if it's a borderline situation where you can stop it right now and not have to continue on with the, with the stoppage of the game and going through the whole warning process, or you can, you know, or you can choose the latter of the two. But yes, any one of those opportunities can exist. And yes, the technical foul is warranted after the second one, the second warning. Um, we got a, a question is on the drive. I'd like to hear their input. If the non-extension of the offensive player's arm is a good indication if there's any illegal contact or not or not. Anthony touched on a little bit. Okay. Absolutely. So, yeah. That's my that's my give right there. That's my give. I'm that tells me right now that that is a pure flop because that left arm, that right arm, does not leave that spot. He's defending himself. He's defending his position. Um, that shoulder, his shoulder doesn't. You know how that he did how we did that shoulder to create space. None of that happens. All he's doing is just trying to get by the guy. Just trying to get by the guy. You know what I'm saying? And the guy and the defender. You know, seek, see, he's, he's a smart guy. So he recognized that. And if you watch that play slowly, you could see at the, at the point at which he starts to throw himself backwards. You can actually see it. He actually leans forward with his torso into the offensive guy and then projects himself backwards. So, yes, that is a, um, that would be my tale on this particular play, especially from the slot that um, the, the lack, the fact that he did not extend his arm. Yeah. I, I, I Understand this. Understand this. The offensive player makes a legal basketball move. Yeah. We can easily tell if that arm extends out too far, that is no longer a basketball move. So therefore, that would deem it illegal. And like the NBA, our guys have gotten smarter and smarter. They see the arm, they feel the arm, and then they catapult themselves backwards. And sometimes even doing that, it causes the offensive player arm to come out a little bit. So that's why you have to judge legal or illegal contact. You have to be able to judge legal and illegal contact because First. our gotten really good at this. They watch film, they watch other players, and when they see that arm come out, they feel it and they can catapult themselves back. So that is where your judgment comes in. Yep. Like I said, 
not a basketball move, then it's an offensive foul. But that right there Absolutely. is an illegal basketball move. Um, one, one, another question who said, uh, when do we stop the clock to give the warning in this case when a team secures the ball or immediately in FIBA, we'd have to wait for the next dead ball situation. Similar to FIBA. Uh, yes, that's why I wanted to see Mark, whether the ball went in or whether the, there was a possession afterwards. So here's the deal. The ball goes in. That's our dead ball prior to it being live again. That would be our, if we chose, if on this play, we chose to give a flop warning, that would be the ideal time to do it. So let's say the ball was not um, was not um, made and there was a, a rebound and an immediate pass outward and a play in the basket. We treat that play the same way we, as we would treat uh, um, a, a technical foul that's already been earned. You know what I'm saying? We're going to let that other team get that basket off unless, he, unless that ball comes to a stall or a stop in front court. Then at which, that's, the, that's the point in which we'll kill it and then resume at the point of interruption. But we would not stop a, um, a fast break or a potential fast, fast break to, um, to adjudicate this particular play. Okay. Um, and another question is, in college, could you go to the monitor? No, we cannot. Okay. Um, uh, we've got Coach Hurston, one of our high school coaches here. At the high school level, how often is this called a charge block warning versus just a play on understanding a lot of high school kids flinch at potential contact. Yeah, we're seeing this a lot. This is one of our high school coaches here in town, and that's a great question. Yeah. Um, well, so, yes, yeah, so the question is, how often is this called a charge block warning versus just a play on? Got you. So, and, um, so this, just so I'm clear with your verbiage, you said, how often is it just called a block or a charge? The warning part is kind of throwing me off, correct? Just wanting so to know I, that. that I, I think what the coach is asking is, is, should this be a charge or a block or a no call? Like what's the consistency there you go. on it? There you go. I, think, I got you. So having having a little having my hands a little bit at the high school level, I can clearly see this particular play being called an offensive foul a lot more than it would be a block at the high school level, which is unfortunate because yet again, the, the, the offensive card, the offensive player does not do doesn't need to do anything illegal, like Rodney said. But from the pure aesthetics of this play. I can see this play being called an offensive foul at the high school level, but that would be incorrect. I, I, I agree. Uh, to answer the coach's question, the, the majority of referees referee the reaction of the defender or the reaction yeah. of the play itself. So if, you, if you're refereeing the, the reaction of the play itself, nine times out of ten you're going to call this an offensive foul because you see all you see is the last two tenths of the play and you see the defender go flying back so you assume that something happened because you didn't see it so therefore i would say nine times out of ten it will be called an offensive foul correct hey mark right reggie hey uh when we're talking about uh, and this is for rodney and aj Yes. Uh, when, when we're talking about warnings and how we go about warning, especially at the, and I'm t speaking specifically at the high school level, um, when we're talking about warnings at the high school level, it is a informal warning. It's not a stoppage of play type. We wait for opportunities like dead ball to let the player know, hey, we got to stop doing that or let the coach know that, hey, if that type of uh, play continues, then we have to do something else with it. That's at the high school level. But at the uh, college level is when we have the uh, first opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, warn at the college level. That is correct. And you know what, and just, and Reggie, and Reggie, just, just something to add on that, man, you know, there's this, they're, they're, they give us some latitude on plays like this as well. I mean, if you want to give an informal on this one, I'm not, I'm not against it at, at any given time of the game. You know what I'm saying? If you want to give an informal on the play, maybe not this one right here, because this one is pretty blatant. He throws himself six feet. But if you want to give an um, a offensive guy the head kick back, you know, when he gets touched by a defender, that play right there, if you want to give him an informal, hey, man, we're not going to do this all night. That's okay. I think that's the, that's that's game management right there. Yeah, in the NBA, we don't have a warning. We uh, it's a five hundred dollar fine, but it's <laughs> oh, 
write it up in the game report. <laughs> All right. What, uh, what, 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 can I get one last question? And go ahead. Yeah. Going, to, yeah, going back to what I said earlier, would you, under high school rules, would you say that this warranted a technical foul? Because under high school rules, there is no there is no warning. A ref, if he feels it's a flop, a blatant flop, and this one is a blatant flop, would you get on the official for calling a technical foul, which would be warranted under the rules? This is a technical foul. Okay. Uh, if, 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 that, if a flop is a technical foul, that then is a technical foul. Absolutely. I agree. Because if, well, if, once you call one, it will stop. It generally will stop it for the rest of the game. Yep. So it sends a it sends a message to both teams. So if I'm your supervisor, no, I wouldn't get on you for calling a technical foul. <laughs> That's what I was going for, Rodney. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great discussion. Let's get into the the next one again. I'll, I'll show it twice for for everybody. Here we go. Hopefully it's not glitching. AJ and Rodney, you able to see that one okay? Yeah, it glitched right at the point of contact, um, but I think I got the gist of it. One more time. Okay. I can go slow on got the it. contact. Yeah. Okay, you can go slower. That's fine. Yeah. Got you. All right. Okay. So yet again, I think once again, um, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the position of the um of my my slot official. I don't even think that I don't even think he made contact. And yet again, we are responding to what we see as opposed. I mean, we're responding to the reaction of what we think we saw as opposed to getting ourselves in a unique position um, to see exactly what we're putting our whistle in. But I mean, putting air in our whistle on. So as you can see right here couple of things I'm looking for. Stop right there, Mark. Right now, he's behind the defender. Right now, my slot official is um, not in an ideal stop, spot. He's not in an A look right now. So whatever he's looking at right now is it's being skewed by his straight line look. So go ahead, advance it a few frames. First thing I'm trying to, I'm trying to pick up is my defender. All right. First thing I'm trying to do is get my defender. I'm looking at the contact. I'm looking at what my offensive player does with the contact, right? Just like with the last guy, which had a great look, he stayed where he was. I would like for my, I would like for my offense, I mean my um my slot official to get in front of that play where he can actually stay on that defender. If he does, he will see that that contact was minimal, marginal at best. The offensive guy turns off of the contact. And what we're seeing right now is we're seeing that head jerk back, another tail guy, another tail. And another thing is we're seeing that the hands wave in the air. Those are all attention getters. Those are all a look at me type stuff. All right. And if you watch your tape, if you watch tape, you will see us. The one thing that we did in fever, if you watch tape, we went to the head, we went to the feet. I mean, we went to the hands because that I'll tell you that told us the story as it related to the defense, the defensive guy. This right here will be worn. This right here will be similar to the last one. This is this is a flop call. Offensive guy feels the contact. He rotates off of it, and the the tail on this one that was the tail on the other one, where the, we was looking for the arm, the the extension of the arm. It's whether he goes through the defender because he's going to the basket on this play. If he continues on through, then we have a different story. He doesn't. He stops. He rotates out. New play flop yeah the first thing i see in in transition if you go back in transition the slot referee number one is watching the dribbler all the way up yeah, the court absolutely. he is watching the he has he doesn't see the defender until the offensive player gets to him he is watching the dribbler don't know why but he's watching the dribbler now because he's going at the same speed of the dribbler, he doesn't get to the proper position to see the defender. So when, you, when you're judging plays, one, 
like Anthony said, did he go through the player? Did he go through his torso? And we can clearly see right there, the offensive player stops for the spin. So we know he didn't go through him. I am not going to guess on this play because, as Anthony said, there is a straight line. I can That slot of referee cannot even see the defender. But like I said, he sees the reaction of the defender and he guesses on the play. Versus if he was coming up the floor instead of watching a dribbler, if his eye on the next competitive matchup, which would have been that defender, I'm getting my eyes in position to see that defender. Not the dribbler, because I don't care if the dribbler is crossing over, going through his legs, it's irrelevant. All I want to know is where, who can hurt me on this play? So I am going to that defender. So if his eyes would have been fixed on that defender, he would have been in position, ready to referee that play. And I guarantee you, he would not have missed that play. Yeah. Because he would have seen the defender, what he did, and if the offensive player went through him. Yeah. Question. The key here, the key here is knowing where you're refereeing. I, I, I see it all the time, especially at the high school level. We are watching the dribbler. We are watching, uh, we, instead of watching the defender on the cutters, we are watching the cutter. We are looking at the moves of the offensive player. I don't really care about the offensive player moves. I don't care about the dribble. I am going to the next matchup that can hurt me. Who can hurt me? Which defender can hurt me? So I'm going from the primary defender to a secondary defender, or I'm coming up in transition. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at which defender is on the weak side or on the strong side that's going to be coming to defend this player. Yeah. So that is where you fix your eye, because right now, if we catch the last one-tenth of this play, you're going to get it wrong every single time. Uh, question, is it possible to go through a player when there is a change of direction at the point of contact? Very difficult so, to do that. Yeah. Because a change of direction, we, it's almost considered a slip. <laughs> It is very difficult to hit a player in the torso to go through a player on a change of direction. If that happens nine times out of ten, that is going to be a blocking play. Because he, unless he anticipates the play or the move of that offensive player immediately, nine times out of ten is going to be a block. But it's very difficult to, difficult to go through the space of a defender on a change of direction. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. The whole thing is the whole thing about going through a player is keeping that point A to point that A to A path. You know, once you, you know, and once again, we're not talking about the elbows or the uh, the extension of the arms and R A, the um the what we talk about when we say the the guy uses his shoulder to create space. We're not talking about those. Those are specific moves designed to create space. This is a spin move right here. We're looking for we're looking for that defender to get there, to, to be there, and or to take the contact, um, and the offensive player to go continue through his space is, is the terminology that we use. So, yep. The bit, and one more thing, Mark, before we go any further, I just finished talking to some guys a few moments ago. What, 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 what Mott just said is, is so, so important here. You always want to referee the player or the area that can hurt you the most. Right, especially when you're not dealing with man, um, you know, primary defenders. Primary defenders, we already know. Find the defender, we gonna he gonna tell the story. But we're in transition. When we're in when we're in on um, crossing action. When we're dealing with freedom of movement. When we're dealing with secondary defenders, you always want to think in your mind as a slot as a as a fish, as an official. All right, next play, next play. Where do I go? What's the area? Or and or what is the person? Um, that can hurt me the most. Don't don't underestimate those words right there, please. Very important. Good stuff. Um, any other questions on this play? All right, good deal. Let's get into uh, clip three. Ah, here we go. All right. <laughs> here we go. 
I got it. It's a good play. It's a good play. Now, who is primary on this play? First question. Yeah. Who is primary on this play? Uh, this this Marshall. Marshall. Go ahead, Marshall. Hey, how y'all doing? Well, good. it's a curl play that from it, it got choppy, but it it's a one-on-one -on -one matchup. It's not a secondary defender. Uh -huh. So he curls towards C. Uh -huh. And C should be able to see, like I said, it chops right here. Lee doesn't have an open look. The open look is at C uh, or slot. I'm anticipating that it's going to be a drop of the shoulder. So I think that on this play, it'd be best if C took this play. Because they, like I said, curling towards the C, the yeah. slot official, and being able to see th through the play. I mean, they, they have clear vision to know who initiated contact, point of contact, and things of that nature. Uh, yeah. So that's my take. Sorry not to jump in. No, no, no that's good. Appreciate it. Correct. Because of the, the lead has a closed look and has no clue on the amount of contact that occurred on that play. The lead referee, the action of the defender falling back, arms up in the air. Correct? Yeah. The slot has an open look. The center has an open look at this play and does not have a whistle. So the center. I'm hoping anyway, is watching the defender and knows immediately that that is a flop. Immediately. Because look at the view of the lead. The lead has no clue on the amount of contact. Can't see the shoulder. Can't see anything. All, he, all the lead can see is the defender falling backwards. So once again, I'm saying, if you, if you have a closed look, do not guess on the play. We have three officials out there. With referee, you always referee where your partner cannot. Right yeah. now, the lead should be saying, I can't see it. It's not my play. I'm going to trust my center on this play. And just to piggyback on that, Mike, you know, <clears throat> I'm glad you start off with that question because if you can't answer that question, then this play right here, we did in the water to begin with. Curl plays always, slot plays primary. I know this play happens in the middle of the paint and, you know, in college and in high school, but definitely in college, we, you know, we, we know we have primaries, but this is the uniqueness of this play. It is a curl play. It does open up to the slot official. The one thing I would like for my slot officials to do is always be ready to referee the next play. All right. He found a good spot when that play developed. I think his, I think that his spot, although his decision to not to blow the whistle is his decision. I think his, you know, I think that as it could have been a position adjustment, a slight position adjustment to continually get peak that A look, right? To continually keep that A look. When that young lady steps in front of him, from when, she, when that secondary defender recognizes it and now steps down in front of him, you always, you know, you can't predict anything, but you always want to have the cleanest look at the entire play as much as possible. So that would be the only thing that I would like for him to have done. Short of that, it is a curl play. It is slots play, and in his and in his decision, that contact was um was a flop. And the lead official needs to stay away from the plays like verticality plays. Those plays you can't tell the story if you're just looking at you can't you can't tell the story if you're just looking at the defender in regards to contact. If you can't see the contact, Rodney said in the last clip, don't guess. Don't guess. And, and, and we go back to being disciplined, being disciplined as a referee. The lead, the lead was disciplined in this, on this play, would not have blown the whistle. Like I said, I'm always saying, I'm out of this play. If I can't see the defender, I am out of this play. So I'm going to try either my slot or my trail if no, there's no, don't blow. to get the play. I'm not going to guess. And it takes discipline not to guess because, like I said, most people have her in their in their belly ready to blow anyway. And when they see the action, they see the contact, they see the, the reaction of the defender, they put air in the whistle because they're afraid of somebody saying, oh, why didn't you blow your whistle? It's an offensive foul. You know, what are you looking at? So it, it takes discipline not to blow in that situation. 
we, we have a question. Could we have a blocking foul on this play? Mark, go back to the beginning of the play. Sure. I wanted to see something real quick. And I'm speaking strictly from a men's uh, Division One perspective. Uh, I was I was checking to see whether the cylinder was a, was going to be an issue. Ah, oof. I'm sorry. I was going to ask the same thing in our game, um, using the RA as a, as a guideline for us in the women's game. Could we have um, established that the defender was in uh, legal guarding position there with a block or offensive foul? Uh, I, I don't know about you guys' rule, but I would say absolutely not, because one, it's a primary defender. Mm -hmm. And number two, how can I call a block when the offensive player just turned? I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, how I could possibly call this a block. Um, I wasn't I mean, saying block. I was saying offensive here, being that she started um, outside of the LDB for us in the women's game. Mm -hmm. uh, could we have gone with an offensive foul here? Your offensive foul or block? Offensive. She said offensive, Rodney. Oh, I'm sorry. Because in the women's game, the RA does not apply to that play because that's not a drive outside the LDB. Yeah, it originates inside. Plus, the RA only applies in the women's game to a secondary defender. That's not secondary, secondary. defender. Correct. Correct. Play it. And play it. It again. wouldn't be in the men's game either because it's primary defender, right? Correct. That is correct, Anthony. That is that is a There's correct. No that's a correct play. statement. Anthony, this is Mike. Uh, you were referring to better position on that curl. Would you say the C uh, maybe stepping down, taking one step down would be the better position that you're talking about? That would be correct. That's the, stop. That's the step that I would have taken. I'm very apprehensive about seeing whole plays, especially when I'm the only – when I have the, the primary look on anything. That would have been – that movement by, that, by her right there, the secondary girl that's in between us, that movement right there would have put me – Yes, right there. I would have, I would have wanted to be on that line right there. To be okay. answer, to, to be quite honest with you, the the question that was asked earlier could it have been an offensive foul. I'm going to say yes. I'm saying it can be an offensive foul if you if you if you deem if you deem right there. See, my thing is on this particular play, she's bailing out. She's bailing out on us. She can tell prior to even the contact right here. She's the head and the hands. So you got to go with the triggers, the head and the hands already gone you see what i'm saying i would want i would like for her personally i would like for her to have gone through her prior or her to have maintained her position um because always you out you call it we always ask ourselves what else do we want the defendant to do right well first of all maintain your position and in in a legal in a legal way so if you if you think if you deem that she had done that if you think she's done that then I think the only option would to be it would be an offensive foul. If you think that that right elbow, that left elbow, I'm sorry, that left shoulder, is what created that space, then you have to go offensive foul. Uh, the who asked that question? Because I'm I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Um, is that a normal basketball move by the offensive player? A normal turn upward motion, motion exactly. shot. Yes. So it's not a, I, I didn't, I didn't, I don't have it as a step into and then up. I just have it as a normal turn and up. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be contact when I turn and go up. So I'm just trying to figure out whoever asked the question, why would I, in order to judge it as an officer foul, is there anything that's not a normal basketball move? And that was the young lady. Call it an offensive foul or not? Well, I was. I'm looking at the shoulder as well on the mm -hmm. contact here, and if we go back to the play, here the contact. It appears that that the defender was there and she was established. I know, but is there anything abnormal about that turn, that shoulder, because she is coming up for a jump shot. 
So it, I, I, I deem it a little different if, I, if I'm going to, if I'm taking a step, that, step into the defender to go up, but right there, both of her feet are on the floor and they're even. So I, I can tell that she did not step into the defender. But right there, when she comes up, that is a normal upward motion shot to me. Is there going to be contact? There, yeah, there is going to be contact because the defender is up on her. So to say that this, that turn in the shoulder contact is not a normal shot would cause me not to call that an offensive foul. Rodney, are you leaning more towards a no call or a block on this? That's the few questions coming. No call. No, no call. call. Okay. Definitely hey, no Rodney. Call. Yeah, Rodney, Rodney, AJ. Go ahead, <clears throat> Reg. Hey, uh, I kind of lean toward what AJ was saying. If the defender stays and not bails, mm -hmm. and what I like to tell the player, if you stayed there you, uh, and took the contact, you may have gotten a charge. That's what I would normally tell a player on that play. But if the defender stays and takes most of that contact instead of bailing out, you can lean toward an offensive charge, offensive foul, if she stays. But because she bails out and doesn't take the contact, then you can't call the charge on the offensive player. And if you look at the offensive player, she's going vertical. She's going straight up, straight down. And AJ, if you could please just reiterate and overemphasize mm -hmm. the fact of uh, when, the, when, the, when the player curls to the center, it is center's opportunity and open look for that play. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, like I said, I can't stress enough when this play happens, whether I'm whether I'm in center or I'm hoping that my center is has the open look, because we have backs on this play. This is a prime the curl play is a prime example of why we say trust our partners and trust the process. Because, you know, we're guessing. This is a this is a guess right, guess let you know, guess right, guess wrong type situation. And the center clearly has the best look at this particular play. That's why it's important. Anytime I feel myself being blinded or my vision has been skewed in any kind of way to actively get to a better spot. That's it. And that's just me. That's just my spidey sense acting up on me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, um, this Marshall again. Um, Go ahead, Marshall. Back to the position adjustment. Can't you see the C is starting to lean? towards the baseline and probably, like you said, if they would have dropped yeah. one step, they probably would have been able to, to adjudicate the play. That way that, that secondary defender wouldn't have got in his sight. Um, yeah. The second comment I want to make is I think the offense play showed discipline by not dropping. Actually, when, they, when she noticed the defensive player way up on her, she actually yeah. pulls up and goes straight up as opposed to, because it looked like her first inclination was to drop the shoulder and create, but once she saw the defender there, she kind of just, just straight pulled up. So if anything, because it's, I understand I, I like the no call, but it'd be really hard to put a charge in my in my view on her because it is a natural basketball movement and is the I defender agree. up in her space. Yeah, and I and I like, I agree with Rodney, I agree with you as well on that particular play. I agree with you on as far as the contact is concerned. And if we lean in, you know, bro, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I'm, I get caught leaning sometimes. That's because, but let me tell you when I'm leaning. I'm leaning when I'm late or when I'm tired. That's it. If, I, if, I, if I'm not, if I'm late on a play, meaning I'm, my, my, my subconsciously, I've, 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 I'm ball watching maybe, or I'm off the play, or I'm surprised by it. So I'm leaning if I'm late or if I'm tired. And we all know what tired looks like, January, February, March. You see what I'm saying? So those are the types. And this is when you got to recognize those situations. And now you got to ask yourself, all right, which one is it? If I'm tired, then I need to make some adjustments. I need to get my sleep. I need to be able to, to, be, able to be in this game at any given point in this game and get this particular play right. If I'm late, that's an easy adjustment. Get your butt there. Simple as that. Hi, uh, Donovan. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to mention at the high school level or at the lower level, I think a lot of officials are going to have a tough time no calling this. Although I agree with you guys that this is a no call, we're taught more or less that there needs to be some kind of whistle on this play. Um, 
And I think with her bailing out, more or less, more officials are going to call a blocking foul on her. Um, that's just what we're taught, that there has to be some kind of whistle on this play. So would yeah. you lean more toward or offensive foul or a blocking foul on it? Why, why are you taught uh, that there has to be a whistle on this play? I, I'm, I'm, there, what is it, the severity, they're going to say it's too much contact to let go. And more often than not, you're going to see this player who is now on the floor is now not in legal guarding position. So if they make contact with anybody, now it's a block to two foul. That's just what we are being taught. I'm, and, I'm just, and that's true. Yeah, I'm just giving you the information. I, I can understand it when there's two players on the floor. Uh, I'm just under the... the uh, impression that if you start calling this in a game, you're going to be calling this play all night. Well, uh, you know what, Brian, let me, let me, let me, let me state, let me say this real quick. <clears throat> I, I know what Donovan is saying. I heard it. I've heard it. And, and I've, and I'm still hearing it. There's two thoughts process. If you call that a block now and you, and you, and you use some preventive officiating, you know, you know, in regards to, when you go to the table, coach, she she bailed on me. You know what I'm saying? Or you go to her and say, "Hey, look, next time, you know, whatever your whatever your preventive part is, you want you want to stop. You you basically want to stop this action if this is a flop, or if this is a block, right, Donovan? So you want to stop this from happening, so you can Correct. stop making this type of judgment. And so it it can it, it can you have enough decisions to make on regular good and bad plays. We don't want to be turned, we don't want to not have to deal with marginal plays as well. So if you do call a block on this young lady for bailing out on you, or anybody for that matter, for bailing out on you because she was not in a legal guarding position, then so be it. And just know that when you do when you do certain things that, you know, the time and, and what's going to, what your purpose behind it is. Because they, yes, you're right. This is I've heard the I've heard the expression. I still hear a lot of my guys who work high school ball. That's too much contact, AJ, for me to pass on. I can't I can't justify that to a high school coach, because the talent scale. I mean, the the skill set is different. Is what they're gonna is how they're gonna challenge you, Rodney. So that's when, that that's why I would say if there was a play on this, a block would be that would would be that answer. And it's only to prevent this play from happening again, because now we know how we're gonna call this play. So stop it. Thank you. Hey, Mark. Mark? Reggie, go ahead. Hey, Mark, isn't this the type of, uh, and, and, and I'm not, because we've all heard it, but just like AJ said, we've all heard, you know, that's too much contact or, or we have bodies on the floor, we need to have a whistle. Uh, but isn't that the thought process that we're trying to get away from and just referee contact versus contact versus uh, no contact? Uh, that's the ones where we want to determine if we want to blow or not. Isn't that the thought process that we're trying to evolve to and get away from? If there, there are bodies on the floor, we have to have a, a call. Or if there's body, more so, if there's bodies on the floor, we need to know why or how they got to oh, the floor. Correct. Yep. Yeah, you, you, you talk strictly at the high school level, right, Reggie? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what we need to get away from. Absolutely. That's why I'm glad what AJ and Rodney said. Like, okay, one player gets to the floor. As long as we know how they got to the floor, this play may be somewhat ugly, but there's nothing illegal. Then we'd have yeah. we have a, a, a no call. I um I do have one question. I think it's a it's a good question as far as coverage. I think everybody understands the coverage as far as this. A, a question was asked: If we take this play on the on the block on lead side and a little deeper in the paint, exactly the same play, but they turn and spin, is the coverage going to be the same? Was the question? Curl play. Is it still a curl play? Yes. Correct. Yeah. So it's going to be the same play, Absolutely. but she just catches it on the on the strong side in front of the lead on the on the block. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it, it's, the, the play is curling away from the lead and curling to the slot or to the center. Then it becomes it is center's primary. Correct. It's difficult, to, it's difficult to judge a play when it's going away from you and it's curling away from you. You know, Mark, the only thing that I would like to add to that is if you put it where you, in the second position that you're talking about, it may bring the trail in more based upon the where the contact occurs. Um, but clearly, I agree with Mike. This is still a curl play. This is still leads. Um, I'm sorry. This is still slots primary. 
AJ, now yeah. in that instance, you you if you put it on the lower block, lead side, you're more apt to have a uh, a cadence or a double whistle. How would you handle that? Well, um, I would handle it like this. If you do have a double whistle with trail, um, I, and it's trail and slot, right? As that's the two that you're talking about, or I'm leaning Reggie. towards it's more more in uh, in lead's lap, so. Lead is yeah. probably gonna have a whistle on it. Okay. And center okay. is gonna have a, a whistle on it. Fair enough. Because Fair enough. Fair. I'm letting. I'm letting. If I'm at lead and I put some leads and blow on it because I, maybe I see. Uh, I think I see something as well too. That slots play. So I'm letting lead. I'm letting that cadence whistle. I'm letting slot have that play. That is his primary first. Now if slot want to give it up to me, then that's on him or her. But I'm. I'm letting. It, I'm letting slot have that play. The, the, the key there, the, the key there that uh, AJ is talking about, though, make sure there is eye contact between the slot and the lead, because we don't want to barge on the play. So yeah. contact determines who's going to take this play. So if if, the, if there's double whistles, you make an eye contact with your partner, telling them to take the play, or yeah. they're blowing off and they take the play. But you have to communicate with your partner who's taking this play. So we won't have two conflicting calls. Correct. All right, let's get into uh, uh, clip four. You got some good plays, Mark. <laughs> yeah, this, now this one I really like because we are seeing this a lot at the high school level, like a one-on-one -on -one matchup in the, in the back course. I think this is going to be a real good discussion because we're seeing this a lot, a lot, every, every single night. So I'll go it twice again. Here we go. Take the sound off. again mm. did it did it uh, lag a little bit i can go to the contact slow mo no, contact. Good. yeah okay nah. okay all right go ahead no you can go ahead and um you can go ahead and finish this one. Oh man i'm gonna tell you like i i let me tell you mark I, I was burnt with this play this year man golly i remember this play like it was yesterday you should say my game um, so <clears throat> everybody, you know, it, it, this particular play right here, as far as position is concerned, as we can see right now, um, uh, let me see, I'm, I'm, go back to the, go back prior to the, all right, let it roll a little bit. Slot official stays back, refereeing up. And they call offensive foul on this play, right? No, he has a he has a block. He has a block. He has, a block. He has oh, defensive okay. foul. Yeah. Then, then, he, then he got it right. Then. Mm -hmm. So here's the here's the here's the play itself, and this is what they this is in the uh, men's division one. I thought they I, I incidentally called an offensive foul because I went with the um with the dislodge. Um, the defender um, the defender right now is using his body right at that moment. Right, he's using his body to uh, to to guard him. And what we're saying, what we're seeing a lot in the men's Division One college game is they're going away from the hands, and now they're saying, "Oh God, these guys are getting better with these hands." And the coaches ain't defending them no more. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I go a hand check in the perimeter, and the coaches attack the players now, regardless of who they are, because they know better. So what they're doing is they're going with their torso, they're going with their bodies, they're going with their hips, trying to do the same thing. And all they want is a disruption of his A to A. That's all he wants, all right? So that's, that's prior to, prior to the, the offensive guy swinging his arms, I think the lead official does a, I mean, does, I mean the new trail official does a good job of maintaining um, his distance. He got, he's, he's identifying that he's being crowded. You see the, um, you see the, um, the, the, the fact that he throws his head back. You see his arms. These are the things that I'm learning just from watching tape, right? The head back and the arms. They almost act simultaneous with each other. He's trying to draw out a flop on us, right? So now we go with the block, which is the correct call, in my opinion, because it was the body contact first. This is that, this is that unique play where... 
we have the we have the uh, let it play all the way out um mark i want to see i thought i thought he fell like the first guy did well in this particular play right here the the embellishment the embellishment of that contact can lean toward and or be a flopping call in the, in my opinion and here's why I would, here's why i would i would i would I would probably go to him because he's a defensive guy on this particular situation. If a guy comes down on the perimeter, if the offensive guy is doing some unique things, we already got him with a block, right? We already got him with a block. So I'm not going to compound it unless I'm trying to be a complete asshole. I'm not going to compound it um, by going block and a flop, which we can, <laughs> which we can, right? So I'm going to probably do some preventive officiating on this particular play. I'm going to say, hey, my man, listen, cut it out. Well, what do you cut it out? Just like that, and it's leave it be. And if I can get to the coach, coach, uh, completely unnecessary. I don't need any help. That's my. That's what I tell them, coach. And I tell the player the same thing. I don't need any help. I don't need any help. So, um, in deeming, just looking at from positioning perspective, you know, I definitely like positioning from the trail official. I think he sees the body contact. I'm glad he doesn't do what I did and get su get suckered by the offensive guy warding him off as well as the flailing of the offense of the defensive guy as well. Rodney, what you got? No, I, I, I agree with you. Um, it's, a, it's a, because it, it's somewhat of a closed look from the, from the trail as far as the arm. And in my, in my perspective, I would have came up and said first foul because first contact, I don't think yeah. a lot. I would have just said, because I'm, I'm saying first foul, not to the players, but to the coaches, because I'm yeah. coming all the foul, I'm blocking foul, and then I'm going to say first foul, because the okay. coach, obviously, everybody, even the fans, sees the flop, and they, they already assume it's going to be an offensive foul. So that's why I would say first foul, and then I would port the block, and then, like AJ said, at some point, I'm going to get them to say, cut it out or play ball. I'm going to tell them, stop flopping. You want to call stop flopping? I'm going to make a comment to them about flopping. So I agree with AJ on that one. Yeah. And that Can first I contact, that's good, too. I like that, Rodney. First contact. I, and I use it a lot because when you got action, reaction, you know what I'm saying? Unless it's, unless it's egregious where that, that reaction is a dead ball contact, situation then you if you definitely want to go with that for and that way a coach knows hey look i got the first file the first contact so yeah that's a good point go hey, ahead, by, uh, i had a comment if you don't mind go ahead. uh by by making that statement first file you're probably killing a lot of unneeded conversation with the coach because you're you're communicating Absolutely. what you're calling and then secondly like you said, we see this play a lot at all levels. The defender never establishes initial legal and guard position. Running up the side of the, of the offensive player, he never establishes initial legal guard position. The only way that this would, like you said, Anthony, would be an offensive if that offensive player threw his arm out at him, which caused him, you know, which dislodged mm -hmm. the defender. But this is almost a no-win situation for the defender because he never establishes legal garden. And like you said, first foul, he, he get, he's running along him instead of getting in front of him and causing him to change direction. Yeah. And just think about this, let's think about the statement you're making right now when you, when you reward him. Cause I, I mean, that's what we're doing. When we go offensive foul, it's a reward for playing good defense. You know what I'm saying? So you reward him with an offensive foul here. He's going to continually do it. You know what I'm saying? And the coach is going to continually expect the same thing in return. Can't happen. Uh, we have a question from uh, an official asking if we would like Trail to be closer to the play, uh, probably more on the floor uh, at the point of contact. So I, think AJ. I think he's in a good position. I mean, he yeah. can't, he didn't know what was going to happen right where it was. In that case, I yeah. would have put is you know on the floor <laughs> but, but you know I think he's in a good position to where he can see the, the first contact he sees yeah. the first contact. 
Hey, Rodney, you remember, you remember back in the days? So let's go, Mark, go back a little bit. This is something I learned when Rodney and I were both kids. So pause right there. The ball right now with the new trail coming up, it also happens with the league. The ball right now is in what we call the third part of the floor, the third lane, if you will, right? There are three lanes. The third lane uh, would be from the, yeah, there you go. That would be the second lane. Thank you, um, thank you, um, Mark. And that would be the first lane. Perfect. You got it. You're already on top of it. So I was always told you want to stay at least one lane away from the ball. That ball is in, the, that ball is in an actively guarded position. That, there you go. I want to get close to the, that's when that oval, that's when that, that, that oval comes into play if the, when the ball is coming up the floor. But when that ball does come back to the middle of that second lane, staying where you are in that lane and just you know, actively staying with the play, your pace of play that we talked about earlier, that right there is, is, is an example of that. So now it comes back into my second lane, got a great look at everything. Now all I got to do is just stay active. Just stay active. You push that play way out over there to the other side, then yes, I would like to see him more come more toward the uh, middle of the floor, but only for a couple steps. I'm not telling him I want to see him on the mascot's face as it crosses half court, but only maybe between the 28 and the 38 foot mark, that little window, because that's, that's where it's going to happen, if it's going to happen. That's it. Can we go back to the beginning of the play? Just sure. One, oh, when we start to come up, okay. okay. Um, on the throw in, pause. Okay. Right here, we have six people in the backcourt, and I do not see my center referee anywhere. Oh, good point. Right? So, so here, for example, now if this ball, if there's a double team over there, I need my center to stay back and referee to pack up the floor. Right now, my center is nowhere in the, in the picture. So now it's causing my trail to referee two defenders. Because this guy right here could have, the, 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 uh, the one at the free throw line could have been grabbed and held, and plus we got pressure on the ball. So make sure you're mindful in transition, pressure in the backcourt, the, the center hangs back and referees to pack up the floor. Because right now, this referee, the trail referee actually has three defenders, six players. Good point. Great point. Yep. Any more questions on, on this play? And we flying. Okay, so we got through four clips in an hour. I do have two more, but I'm I'm if Rodney and AJ up to you guys. I'm good shutting it with an hour. We've got a lot done. Up to you. Okay, let's finish it. Okay. Go. Yeah, Break let's finish it. it. Appreciate you guys. All right, let's get into this one. Oh, I think this is one of my favorite plays. Uh, let me see. Do you see it? A little flop on the I got it. on the book. Okay. Yeah, I got you now. I see just I got, you. I got it. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. You got it? Yeah. First of all, who's primary? Let it play. Lead. This is Leeds play. Leeds. Leeds play. Correct. We have a real curl play here, right? That's the Leeds play is outside the it's outside the key, correct? That is the only that is the only defender that the lead, lead is refereeing right there. Because he, the lead is the only one to have an open look at that play, correct? Correct. Correct. So only thing I don't, only thing I don't like, the lead is a little wide, and then the lead starts to, to close down during the contact. I would like the lead to be stationary, the referee to play. But it is clearly a flop. Agree? I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just watching the lead right now because the lead is primary. The lead starts to close down instead of instead of being stationary referee in the play. I just I'd like them stationary. Now watch when the ball passes to the corner. 
Where does the eyes of the lead go? The ball. To the ball. The ball. We, yeah, we, we just had a player get up off the floor. So I, I don't care what happens with the ball. I am ref, I, I got I have five people in the key. Five people in the key. So my next area of responsibility becomes one the ref the player that gets up off the floor, make sure there's no reaction from him getting up off the floor. Next, rebounding. Not to the shot in the corner. Yeah. So that's the first thing I'm looking for. You brought up a good point, Rodney. So and this is maybe a loose example of it, but you know, when we have the pass and crash, we um how do we referee that guys? Who stays with the pass? I'm sorry, who goes with the pass? Who stays with the crash? Open to the table. Lead stays with the crash and uh and the uh center, if it's going to the opposite wing, center would, would take lead stays with the crash, C handles the, the pass being completed. Correct. Correct. I agree with you on that, definitely. And that's what you know, similar to what we have right here. I agree with I agree with you, Rodney. We have a guy that's taking that 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 that's once again flopping, you know what I'm saying? Um and uh and we have an we have a center official since we've been talking so much about the center official who constantly makes adjustments prior to you know when well, this is after the shot right now but going on the onset of the play constantly is making adjustments not being settled in in one spot as he um as he looks because if he doesn't you know if there's if there is a a play on that or if that is an offensive foul you know and, and for whatever reason Lee doesn't see it and or doesn't have a look at it the only other person who has a decent chance of getting this play right would be that slot official because Trail had multiple players in, in his line in his line of sight. So the slot official in this particular, uh, kudos to him for continually making adjustments and not selling just for one spot once that play developed. Questions? Uh, Mike Kelly, you got a question? Go ahead, man. Hey, I wanted to ask. I know we're um, at lead. Um, are we okay with the no call? And if it's not a no call, could we place a block as far as for uh, the betterment of the game to to prevent further flopping from that same player or possibly same matchup? Well, you know, I, we, I think that's the same question that we had last time. You know, in in regards to in regards to the men, speaking on um, speaking along the lines of men's Division One basketball, that play right there um, is a flop. You know what I'm saying? And I think once it's looked at real time by your your boss and by the coaches, they would agree to the same thing. Um, putting a block on that particular play is old school. And I mean, will it work? It possibly, but I can't get away with it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but because they're going to ask you, you know, you know what happened. You know what I'm saying? If you want to go with a block in today's game, just be ready to make, just be ready to explain it. It is a flop, though. If you come out with it, if you want to come out once this ball goes to the hoop and you want to penalize this player in today's game and you want him to stop that, they are now giving us an additional weapon other than just putting a foul on him. And that that weapon is a flop now. Yeah, hey, uh, we, we need that at the high school level. The reason being, uh, instead of putting a foul on the player, first of all, you have to know the consequences of your whistle. So. Yeah. Even though, I mean, our guys are not the smartest in the world, but let's say now you call that a block and that's his third foul when you didn't have to call it. So I'm just saying I always know the consequence of your whistle. In our game, I, I generally know who's in foul trouble, who is not. I, yeah. I, I already know who, who may take a foul and who may not. So in this case right here, if this is, maybe if this is uh, his first foul, okay, you, you can do a block. Yeah, but and know the consequences of your whistle because that one that is a big guy and obviously I would have to say he's a starter because he's starting in the second half with 17 minutes to go. So I would not want to give a foul like that to a starter, regardless of whether it's a block. I'm not trying to send that kind of message. Yeah. So this know the consequence of your whistle as well. Hey Rodney. Yes. Hey, going back to positioning and, and the positioning of the lead and at the start of this play. Uh, take a look at no, 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 Mark. Go back to the finish. Right there. Okay. 
right there where he's at right now is where we would want would have wanted him at the original origination of the play, correct? That is correct. Or in that, at least in that vicinity, because if you, it, it, I, I don't know where the ball came from right there. Like I said, we, when the ball was passed in, he should have already been there. So now he starts to move. And, and, and Daryl Garrison used to always say, when you're moving, your eyes are moving, your concentration level drops. Yeah. And that yeah. is that's true even in transition or whatever. Whenever you're moving, your concentration drops. So when you're, when you're stationary, your eyes are not moving, you, you make a better, you have better judgment. So I would have liked them already be there, standing still to, to, to referee that play. And the reason why I wanted to overemphasize that is because here in San Antonio, I know uh, the tendency or the system that we, unfortunately, I, I find myself looking at all the time is that our leads are, are too wide most of the time. Instead of moving within each position, they stay wide most of the time during plays. Yeah. Okay, last. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. I was just gonna say, uh, from the looks of it, when uh, Mike Michael was saying about the block, I mean, when you see the offensive player, he kind of had to jump over the kid when he fell. So I, I think that would help. I mean, that would kind of explain why we were, why we would call the block. I understand about the third foul and all that, but I mean, it, he almost traveled because of it. So if that was causing him to travel, then we would come with a block. I mean, I, I would think so. I agree. I agree. I agree. Point. Okay. Last last clip. I, I, I do have a question, Mark. Go ahead. Uh, and this is for Mr. Lauder, AJ. What are your key indicators to um, to anticipate the next pass or the next play in trying to get into that better position? Hmm. Well, first of all, if I recognize that this position, that if I if I see that a defender is beat. All right, and he is no longer a threat to me. That's how I look at it. I'm gonna go to the most threatening person on the floor or the most threatening spot on the floor that might be at the rim, that might be at the box, I mean, at, at the low post. You know what I'm saying? That might be the secondary guy that's designed to pick him up. So my thing is, I don't know if it's more or less of a, the mindset of going, of knowing, okay, I'm done with this play, off to the next play. It's a my, you know, I don't know if, and maybe Rock and maybe Mike could to give can give you something more specific, but but I can just tell you that I'm constantly thinking of the next area, the next area. I'm seeing a defensive guy. We all know when the play is dead, when the defender is beat, and you know whether he recovers or not. Okay, well then if he does something extra, then it'll be obvious. It'll be even that much more blatant, if you will. But um, if he doesn't and he's relying on help defenders then that's my, it's my job to now figure, okay, I'm done here. I'm not going to get too, too tunnel vision into this one particular play, um, um, should I say matchup. I'm off to the next one. That's my trigger. Same. I, I, I generally deem it as competitive matchup or going to the next matchup that can hurt me. So yeah. when, when, a, when a player, trust me, when, when – when players are going to the basket, there is always going to be help defenders. You anticipate help defenders. You anticipate the, the guy coming off the screen. So when somebody's rolling to the basket, I am immediately going to that defender that is going to be guarding that player. So it is, a, it is an anticipation of the next play. You may get it wrong one time, but the bottom line is you are reading the play. You are reading the play. When that screen, when that, when you see that 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 offensive player running the baseline, and there's going to be that elbow screen that they all run. Well, if I'm in the center, then that means I'm already going to be stepping down while that player is running the baseline before he even gets to the uh, elbow. So I can be in position already below the elbow, the referee, that defender. So it's an anticipation of the next play. And that is where your mindset, that is, that is good refereeing. When you can anticipate the next play, the next defender, the next competitive matchup, you are on top of your game. 
Yeah, agreed. All right, great stuff. All right, last last clip of the evening. Here we go. Hmm. I'll do it one more time. Yeah. Well, he did all that good work, all that hard work to get down to the baseline to get the play wrong. <laughs> Man, if I'm going to work that hard to get to the baseline, the least I could do is get the, get the play right. <laughs> oh, um, boy. You can't really – I, I, I looked at my lead official. I like his aggressiveness. He got to a spot. He, he, he picked up his defender. Um, it's got to play wrong. Um, I, you know, in regards to, I know the theme tonight is about flopping, but if you once again, look at this play and if you go back and, and I guess a lot goes toward level of experience. And this is why moments like this is important because go ahead, let it go to the point of contact, Mark. I mean, she's literally, she's literally halfway down prior to even contact occurs. Because right there. And it doesn't even have to. Because if she just maintains that spot, she's good. So none of that is actually necessary in regards to the in, in regards to, to the um the defensive player doing that. But um looking at the lead official, coming back, um, removing go ahead, Mark, get it to down to the you know, I'm not really certain why he's moving out again. That 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 go there and goes what we just finished talking about as far as pushing out. He had a great look. He had a an ideal look as at the defender going into that slump, going into that um that matchup. I would have liked for him to possibly stay where he was even prior to those last two steps going outward, because now his concentration level has been skewed by his movement. And now, because the movement of the of the of the matchup changes, he does he's now putting himself out of a um, of a uh, of a good look. Yeah, I I, I agree. It, it, what happened? I, I I think I can pretty much guess at what happened on this play. In transition, when you when you run it back, in transition with when he first was getting to the baseline, he looked at the defender. Yeah. Now he takes his eye. I tell you right where he takes his eye off of the defender. Right there. Right there. Right, right there. He takes his eye off of the defender and he starts watching the dribbler. So he starts to back out. So now he is he is no longer referee in this play. He is no longer referee in this play because now he is walking away from the play. And the only thing he's watching now is, is there a double dribble? He's watching the dribbler. Don't ask me why people do it. They watch the dribbler. And now he does not referee the play. Now he sees a, the defender falls, offensive foul. But he got there, and now he took his eyes off the defender and went right to the dribbler. And he was no longer refereeing that play. You know, the offensive foul, the offensive player, you know, she has her arm out. She doesn't extend. She doesn't bully through. She's not doing anything. Like we talked about the, the young, the curl play, the, you know, she's entitled to go to the basket. She's entitled to defend herself. You know what I'm saying? Or she's actually to defend the ball. As long as she doesn't extend or use it as, you know, or use that extra arm to create space, um, which she doesn't. But he, you know, he misjudges it simply because, like you said, once he picks up her, once he now focuses from the defensive player to the offensive player, you know, what she did could have been in his mind may have been deemed because like Rodney just said, he already got to defend the legal. And she was until she fought, until she bailed on us. She was legal until, I mean, all she had to do was take it and then she, it would have been an offensive foul. But until she decides that she wants to not take it and flop on us, that's when she loses it. And that's why, and that's what, that's why I would deem this a flop and not an offensive foul. Any, hey, any questions? Reggie, go ahead. AJ, can you speak on uh, the finishing of the players and how that can provide you with information? I. Oh, absolutely. I.e., one player laying on the floor and the player that had the ball is over there by the arc 
through the baseline, which tells you that the player didn't go through it. I mean, exactly. You know, you know, you the finishing of any any possession for that matter, for any con, you know contact, i.e., be it marginal contact or um or something that was actually significant. You you want to look at the finish before you put the air in the whistle in that in in those situations. But you know, if you look at where she at where she's at right now, you know, she lays down. Go ahead, let it let it um. And and if you just notice how. You know, it, this, you know, everything about her, everything about the antics in which she's doing right now is, is saying flop. But once again, you're taking your eyes, like Reggie was saying, you're taking your eyes off of the defender, like Mott was saying, I'm sorry, you're taking your eyes off of the defender, you're putting them on the offensive person, and the defender tells us our story. The way she finishes would have told you that that was a flop. Mark? No, I agree. Yeah. I think she was, she was already on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> she was sliding. She was sliding to the floor. Man, the I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you right now. As hard as it is to get from trail to lead, <laughs> <laughs> these days on these legs, the least you can do is get the play right when you do get down there. Any other questions on this on this play? We're right about to, to close things up. Okay, uh, Rodney, AJ, we really appreciate you guys taking the time um, to help everybody. And get, but I have recorded it, so if anybody um, wants it, I'll throw it up on YouTube, but you guys are more than welcome to contact me. I can get you a copy of it. Uh, again, appreciate y'all doing this. Everybody stay safe. It's kind of a weird time, so continue to do what we're supposed to do. Um, continue just keep watching film, getting better. That's all we can really do right now. We can't get on the floor. So it's a good time for us to continue to educate and get better. Um, again, we thank you guys. Go ahead. We're always open for questions, any dialogue. Reach out Absolutely. anytime. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys. I want to say thank, thank you as well. Thank you guys for all that you do. It's, it's very much appreciated um, from everyone. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, really, man. Really and and tell you what. Really is helpful. No, go ahead. Thank you. And I appreciate that. You know, I mean, it's one thing to have us up here doing what we do, and, but it's another thing that's a credit to you guys for showing up, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and listening, and not only listening, but, Britain, but engaging, because, you know, when you teach, you learn. You know how it is. I'm sure we've all been on both sides of the, uh, of the schedule, um, pendulum here, but I do appreciate you. Thank you very much as well. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. We try to get this together in Vegas to do things like this, and sometimes you know, five referees will show up. So I appreciate appreciate you guys' effort. And like I said, reach out to us anytime. Ask any questions. We, we're here. Like, we're not going anywhere. I'm, I'm still on lockdown, so I ain't going to. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great All right, Take care. Take care. Yeah.